Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 398th episode, we have an interview with Cameron Muskelly. We have Dinosaur of the Day, Ida Miris. And I have a fun fact all about how long it takes a fossil to become a fossil. Ooh, that is a fun fact. I think so. (laughs) It might fit the term fun fact better than some of my fun facts. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons. This week, we'd like to thank Lawrence, Blue Gollimer, Wyatt, TRX Dinosaurs, A Mato Titan, Anne, Ayrton and Everett, Mycoraptor, Jonah, and Vincentrosaurus. Hey, thank you so much for being part of our dinosaur community and for supporting us on our show. So without further ado, we're going to jump into our interview with Cameron. But again, as always, we have an extended version of this interview for our patrons. So if you are a patron, make sure to check out the premium content feed for the longer version if you're interested. So we're joined this week by Cameron Muskelly. He's an avocational paleontologist and geologist and paleontology educator based in Georgia. And he's also a researcher, lecturer, and fossil collector and an expert in Appalachian geology. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I guess the first question that we kind of have to ask is, how did you get into dinosaurs? That's a really good question. So just like a lot of common stories, I've had a fascination with dinosaurs ever since I was little. I started off having a having an in-depth interest in all types of objects and things of that nature. But I think my mother got me a dinosaur toy. And from <laughs> I think from, from one of her coworkers, and I was just fascinated by it. I think I, I still have it up in the closet today. She gave me a stuffed triceratops, and she also gave me a zoo book with, I think, Mark Hallett's paleo art on it, and it said dinosaurs on it. And I was just fascinated by that ever since. And everybody knows me since I was growing up in school. Everybody knows me as the dinosaur guy. In fact, my <laughs> nickname in school was Dinosaur Boy. And <laughs> so, and I still have very close friends to this day uh, that still call me that. that was great (laughs) so then what does it mean to be an avocational paleontologist and geologist so an avocational paleontologist there are basically people who do paleontology without a degree so at the moment i don't have a, a degree at the moment so i would fancy myself as an avocational paleontologist gotcha cool you said at the moment does that mean you're thinking about getting a degree Yes, um, I'm working on trying to get a geology degree. Oh, cool. Yeah, that would be the next question is, are you going the geology or the biology route? <laughs> yeah, I, I love rocks. I really do. So I'm definitely probably going to be going into the geology route and study paleontology that way. Awesome. With leading into that, can you tell us about the types of fossils that you find near you? Mm-hmm. Well, the fossils near me, we don't have any fossils. So I live near the Atlanta area. And so there's a lot of igneous and metamorphic rocks. So we don't have any um, in place fossils or anything of that nature. Really no sedimentary rocks, except for the sedimentary rocks that are now metamorphosed that probably did contain fossils in them, but don't any longer. So if you want to look for fossils, typically the fossils that I collect are things like brachiopods, corn corals and things of that nature, you want to go up to Northwest Georgia around the Chattanooga area, close to the Tennessee Georgia borderline to look for those really old rocks that are Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, and Carboniferous in age. Cool. Yeah. Do you guys also have, I feel like there's a Mosasaur or some sort of aquatic large reptile that's been found in Georgia. Is that, am I remembering that right? Um, we don't have any complete skeletons of Mosasaurus, but we do have isolated bits and pieces of Mosasaurus fossils that mm-hmm. have been found near South Georgia, near the Columbus region. And we also do find dinosaur material that's been found out there, too. Again, not articulated, nothing like the stuff that you'll typically find in Montana. Alabama actually has the best record of dinosaur fossils in the southeastern part of the United States. But unfortunately, Georgia's not Alabama. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we do have like Tyrannosaur material, we have duckbill dinosaur material, and we actually do have ornithomimic material, and we do have raptor material. So we mm-hmm. have like isolated bones and teeth from those particular types of dinosaurs. If that's in southern Georgia, I'm guessing that that was marine at the time, and it's just that's why it's not so complete, or were there periods when it was actually land in the Mesozoic? 
So yeah, so you're what you're looking at there in South Georgia is the ancient coastline. So you would have had dinosaurs living on that ancient coastline. They would die, and then their bodies would get washed out to sea, and then animals would scavenge on their carcasses as they were floating out to sea, and then their skeletons would be sank down to the bottom to become fossilized. So all of the rocks that or all of the sediments that we do have dinosaur fossils in them are all marine. Gotcha. Yeah, that's similar to around us in California. Most of the, there are some dinosaurs we find here, but they're mostly like chunks that washed out to sea and eventually sunk. And you find little bits and pieces, but not usually full yeah. skeletons. Occasionally, yeah. but rarely. <laughs> yeah, it's very common um, that we have like boat and flow carcasses mm-hmm. that we have there in Georgia and Alabama. So all the fossils that we do have from the southeastern part of the United States, there are some exceptions where there are dinosaur fossils that are found in terrestrial deposits, but Specifically in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, those are all Cretaceous marine, and they all have dinosaur fossils that are disarticulated. Gotcha. You got any kylosaurs? We do have notosaurs. Nice. I did go to Alabama. I went to the McWayne Science Center, and there are ankylosaur material that has been found, scutes, pieces of the skull, and things like that. The stuff that's not tasty for the scavengers seems like you should be yeah, able to find. Apparently, they didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but for a paleontologist, it's like, yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know you also do a lot of research, and you're a member of a lot of societies. It's Georgia Mineral Society, Atlanta Geological Society, the Paleontology Association of Georgia. So what, what kind of research do you do? So right now, so my focus is on invertebrate fossils. I really like trilobites. If anybody follows me on social media, I talk about trilobites 24-7. I have a trilobite tattoo. So I like trilobites. (laughs) But um, some some of the focus is what I'm working on are Paleozoic fossils. So fossils that are around 500 million years old to around 252 million years old. So anything from the Cambrian all the way up to the Permian. But I specifically study the Cambrian and Ordovician fossils that are found in Georgia. And I've collected trilobites before. I've looked at Cambrian fossils. And what we want to, re- and the best thing about the Cambrian fossils that are found in Georgia is that we have similar preservation to the Burgess Shale. Hmm. Um, we do have like soft body preservation that is found in a formation called the Kanasaga Shale, which is wow. about 505 to 497 million years old. And so part of what I want to look at are some of the more soft body remains that are found in Northwest Georgia, as well as looking at some of the um, older Cambrian fossils. So part of what I'm working on right now um, is a project that I'm kind of getting off um, with the curator of the um, of the Teles Museum are archaeocyathic fossils. Mm. And those fossils are really, really cool. Um, they may not look like much, but they really do tell in a really incredible story about the history of the planet and especially about the history of Georgia. Um, these are actually the oldest fossils in the state. So these are about um, 516 million years old. And archaeocyathids are believed to be fossil sponges, and they are the first reef builders in Earth's history. Mm. And so it's the first organisms that we actually see in the oceans that are very, very abundant. Wow. And we de- and they are actually form their own reefs. Um, archaeocyathids are composed of calcium carbonate, very similar to those of corals living today or living in the past. And they were very abundant in some of the Cambrian rocks that we see in Northwest Georgia. And what I want to look at is try to compare the specimens that are found in California, because California has a very rich um, archaeocyathid fauna, as well as some of the lower Cambrian fossils, and maybe try to compare that to the stuff that's actually found in Georgia. Oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. Mm-hmm. And you're doing a lot of field work, too, around this project, right? Yes, um, I, I love field work. Um, I love digging in the dirt, <laughs> looking <laughs> for stuff that no one has ever seen before for hundreds of millions, if not half a billion years. But yeah, I've looked for Cambrian trilobites. I haven't looked specifically for archaeocyathid fossils, but I've seen them in museum collections. Mm. So I think one day I would love to actually go out and look for those particular types of sponge fossils. What's it like being out in the field? I mean, we we did it once, but it was very tame, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, a lot of the places that I typically go out in the field are like on the sides of roads. Mm. So that's what we're doing our geology. We're doing roadside <laughs> geology. So we we're sometimes just go on the side of a road and we're looking at a limestone outcrop and then boom, you see a, a fully 445 million year old intact coral reef. Wow. <laughs> so... And I'm actually going back to that location um, next week, so I cannot wait to look at that coral reef again. Yeah. And um, it's truly remarkable looking at these 
you know, ancient um, environments that no longer exist that are just now now lithify this rock on the side of the road. It's truly, I mean, it's truly remarkable. Many people who pass by those roads places won't even think that there's fossils in those rocks, but it, it used to be that 150 million years or, you know, sometime between 300 million years that those rocks are now were once under a, a shallow sea and are now just sitting on the side of a road <laughs> waiting for you to be explored. I'll tell you an entire yeah. story about another lifetime. <laughs> exactly. Is this a, a just I'm trying to imagine in my head, is this like a major paved road or is it like some smaller dirt road like where people might imagine, you know, you go fossil collecting? I think there's probably uh, just a dirt road. Some of them are dirt roads. Some of them are just, you know, roadside. Like if you're like turning off to like uh, Chick-fil-A or a McDonald's, <laughs> you see like a rock <laughs> outcrop right there. I remember back in Alabama, there was a rock outcrop. It was carboniferous in age. So we were finding plant fossils. And But this, this was behind a Walmart. <laughs> this, this outcrop was literally behind a Walmart. We're looking at shale and we're finding trace fossils and plant material from the carboniferous period. It's crazy. Wow. Do you get clued into it because there's a paleontologist or someone familiar with fossils that's like driving and notices it? Or what's the... How do you usually come across these sorts of sites? Well, I'm typically the one who just points at them like, <laughs> there's fossils in those rocks over there. <laughs> so I have to be extra careful because I'm I'm probably my friend is sitting beside me mm-hmm. and I'm I'm looking at the rock outcrops. I'm like, there's probably fossils in there. And I like and I can and I know a little bit more about the geology than some of my friends do who just don't you know, don't care about rocks. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's the postural formation that has plant <laughs> fossils in it. We should probably go there and look for some stuff. Don't get too excited when you're driving, though. Is that way you have to be careful? <laughs> yeah, you got you got to be very you got to be extra careful because you can get distracted. Yeah, <laughs> and I get distracted all the time by rocks. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the telltale signs? Are there anything anything big that stands out, or you just you know from these details? I, I could just like if I like sometimes I may pull up a geological map and I can look at some of the rocks and what the formations are, and if I know the formations and if I'm familiar with them, I can probably determine that there were that there are fossils in those rocks. Mm. So if like just basically understanding where you are and the geological time in which those rocks are found in. Gotcha. And then are you looking at just the rock enough to see that it's probably sedimentary rock where you're seeing like those layers and that's the, the all the giveaway you need? Yeah. If I if I can see if I know that the rock is, you know, bedded and that can determine that, yeah, this is probably sedimentary in origin. Or if I know the formation, like say I'm looking at the Kanasaga shale and we know that shale is a sedimentary rock and shale has a possibility of containing fossils, I can say, hey, this probably contains fossils because it's part of that unit. And let's go see if there's any fossils in there. Gotcha. Is is part of the reason you end up at roadsides because... I think of Georgia as a very green and lush state, which means a lot of the rock is under dirt and it's not so easy to spot fossils. But when you put in a road or a parking lot or something, they usually cut through some rock. Is that how you, you th- is that partly why you end up at roadsides? Exactly. Yeah, they, they're cutting through all of that rock and they're, t- they're probably using the rock for like buildings and things like that. But no one's looking at that stuff except for rock hounds and geologists. <laughs> so I, I remember going on a couple roadside trips and there's people that are honking at us and waving at us. I'm like, it's just geologists doing what geologists do. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean wherever you go, you need to carry some tools around with you? Oh yeah. I, I definitely carry tools like a rock hammer. I'm always have my field notebook uh, by my side. Um, I've got a video camera too, so I can kind of just make sure that I record everything about it. Because if you collect a fossil and you don't know where it is, it's going to be it's going to be really hard to try to determine what that type of fossil is and where you found it. Mm-hmm. So I try to take as much detailed notes as possible when I'm out in the field. Do you have a, a quick way to get GPS coordinates too? Is it just like an app on your phone or something? Yeah, I can pull it up on my phone or I can ask one of my friends to see if they can, you know, record the coordinates for me. But sometimes I don't always have a signal. So I sometimes I can take a picture and that picture will record the coordinates of that site, and I can get down and write the coordinates later. Oh, yeah. I forgot oh, about yeah. it. Get it in the metadata. It's mm-hmm. even easier. Then you don't have to worry about which picture goes with which coordinate. <laughs> yeah. I, I can go on like Google Photos and then figure out what the coordinates are and write those down. Cool. And I guess, do these videos, I know you've got a, a YouTube channel, and you teach people about like fossils and discoveries and stuff. Was, was this kind of the basis for it? Was these 
finding things on the side of the road and filming it a little bit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually um, started a new series about maybe about a year or so ago. It was called Where and When in the World is Cam? <laughs> and so I'm out there on the roadside and I'm explaining what we're finding just on the side of the road. And I'm pulling out like a piece of a horn coral or a piece of a trilobite. And I'm saying, hey, you can find this. It's not that hard. It's on the side of the roads. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have the eye for it still. Oh, yeah. You definitely have to have an eye for it. You have to kind of know, you like have an understanding of the geology of where you are. Yeah. It definitely helps, like you're saying, too, if you know, if you're familiar with the fossils as well, because most people might see a horn coral and not know that that's a fossil because it's not a tooth or it's not, it doesn't look like a trilobite or anything like that. Right, right. I guess if you wanted to start doing this on your own, like, do you have any advice? Like, what would people need to study up on so that they could? spot these things on the side of the road? A big thing that I would probably say is having a geological map by your side. You could probably pull it up online or you can go to, if your state has a geological survey, or you can go over to your public library. They may have a geological map by your side. Or now these days, everything is digital. You can pull it up on your phone. We have apps now. Um, I remember I have an app in my phone called Rocked, and you can pull that up. And it'll tell you what the original geology, it'll tell you the rock type, and even tell you what types of fossils you may find in those rocks. Oh, cool. Wow. So, and not just that, it'll tell you the paleogeography. So it'll pull up a, a geological map of that area and, fi- and basically show you how the continents were arranged when those rocks were forming. So that's really cool, too. I love having the, that by my side. So everything is digital now these days, but it's always great to have you know, paper, it's always good to have, you know, the the standard pen and paper by your side so you can actually understand where you are. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So that's a really good, important thing to do. And basically, you know, understanding, you know, your types of rock, your igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic, your limestone, shales, siltstones, mudstones, et cetera. And what types of fossils that you're finding based on the rocks or how old those rocks are. So let's say you're finding fossils from the Ordovician. The fossils that you'll probably find are the Ordovician are probably tabulate to horn corals. Typically, they'll sometimes be in limestones. So you really just want to understand what the rocks are and how old those rocks are so you can determine what the fossils that you may find are. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. So depending on which age you're looking in, you want to look in a different type of sedimentary rock too. Is that what you're saying? Right, right. Some fossils are going to be easier to find in shale. Some rocks are going to be easier to find in limestones. Hmm. So you always want to make sure you you kind of look up on what the rock type is. Now, at what point like, do you say, oh, I found something so big, I need to contact my local museum? I never found that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, because a lot of the things that I'm working with are very, very small. And, you know, many people don't care about horn corals mm. or little bits and pieces of trilobites. But if you want to, I say collect anything that looks weird. If anything looks weird, collect it. Make sure you get all the data on that. I remember I collected what I thought was just a piece of algae, it may actually be a fossil sponge. Mm. So, and I collected that back in 2016 in the Conestoga Shale, and it's now um, in the museum collections at the Telus Science Museum. Mm. Um, I've donated a lot of fossils to them, um, and I'm actually planning on donating a lot of fossils now. So I have a couple of fossils, but if you see anything that looks weird that you may not see before, or it looks very different, from the texture, I would say collect it and maybe get it to a museum and have it identified. And if that paleontologist or geologist determines to, for it to be new or you know something that needs to be looked up on or studied more, hand it over to the museum and you may and it may actually be a new species. You never know. Yeah, that's cool. I I guess yeah. Then a follow up question for your field work: Where have you gone for field work? I've mainly stayed in the southern part of the United States. But I I had a paleontology internship back in 2021, and I was basically going through Mississippi and Alabama, looking at some of their fossils and some of their rock outcroppings and see what they had to offer in regards to some of the fossils. So I've been through Mississippi collecting Alabama. I've done parts of Georgia. Let's see. I've done parts of Tennessee, and I've done parts of Florida. Wow. Yeah, you got the whole South covered pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely more to explore, though. <laughs> is there a place that is on like the the place you really want to go to explore? That's a good question. I really want to look at some of the rocks that are in 
North Carolina, there's some late Triassic deposits that have some really interesting Triassic rhetoric material. I would definitely want to look at that and check that out. I would love to go up to New York State and look at their trilobites, their Devonian mm. and some of their Cambrian material that they have there. I have a lot of the geologists that I know are all up in New York and they've been wanting me to come up there and to look at their some of their really interesting Devonian outcrops. So I would love to go out there and look for some Devonian trilobites. See a road trip in your future, North Carolina, New York on the, you know, at the end. Yeah. <laughs> and definitely if I, if I was to, I would definitely come to California too. There's so many fossils in California. And in fact, some of the best outcroppings of Cambrian rocks, lower Cambrian rocks come from California. So mm. we'd love to go there. Is there a specific part of California? I don't know too much, but I know there is the Palata Formation, which has some archaeocyathids and Cambrian material. There's places where close to Death Valley, where there's fossils and trilobites that are found, mm. but definitely want to go through the Nevada and Nevada and California region looking for stuff. Nice. Yeah, I guess I should have guessed that it would be out in the desert because that's where, you've, where the rocks are exposed. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring water. That's the that's the thing. Yeah, definitely bring water. Um, I know that I've looked at some of these locations before. I'm like, yeah, it looks like the Sahara Desert out there. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. it is rough. Yeah, we've been in the California desert. I used to go hiking when I, when I was younger. I lived in San Diego. And on weekends, sometimes we would go out into the desert and go for hikes because it was pretty. But it was, you drank mm -hmm. so much water. It was crazy. Gotta be prepared. Still yeah. be careful. You could drink like a gallon of water in like a day hike. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> this is a lesson. Please drink water. Even if you're not in the desert, water mm -hmm. is so important. Please drink it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, down where you're at too, it's it's hot. You sweat. You need water. <laughs> Ooh, boy, is it. Especially when you're doing field work and there's no shade mm. and you're out in a quarry and you're whacking with your hammer on a very, very hard limestone chipping mm -hmm. out something, it gets hot and yeah. you get tired. So you definitely want to bring gallons of water. I remember I brought a water bottle and I was, and I set my water bottle by this limestone. I was trying, actually trying to extract an echinoid and the water evaporated. <laughs> so oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm, and I was really thirsty. So I had to go back to the truck and fill up it with water. And uh, it was, it was so hot. I, yeah. This was back in Mississippi and yeah, Mississippi summer is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you keep like in your your kit besides the so we got the notebook a camera water a video camera as well as the cell phone camera is there anything else you always keep around uh rock hammer chisels um i keep like some tissue paper to kind of wrap up fossils that they're very delicate bags so I can keep those fossils in and even index cards. So even if I don't have my notebook by my side, I can literally just jot down those notes and put it within the specimen and have something like a, like a backpack to kind of carry all those tools. Mm -hmm. I carry more than one backpack. You know, I have one backpack for tools and I have one backpack for when I usually take it out and bring it out in the field with the tools that I'm going to be bringing out. I don't just have one big backpack toting all of that material. Mm -hmm. It gets really heavy. And then you've got rocks that you want to put in those backpacks. And so that's going to be even more heavy. So I have to carry a separate backpack to put those rocks in. So maybe carry separate bags. I'm also a diabetic. So I have to carry medicine with me. If you are someone who is a diabetic or has you know, an issue with health, definitely want to carry medicine and definitely carry more medicine that you that you would think you would need for the field. Mm -hmm. Always have extra on you. Yeah, because yeah. you don't always know how long you'll be out there or maybe it's a long hike, longer than you expected. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I suppose food is probably an important one too. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely food I mean, and definitely healthy food. I typically would bring granola bars and things of that nature, bread, you know, things that would, things are very, that are high in carbs where you can use that and you won't, you know, lose energy. If you're out in the hot sun or if you're working really hard, you want to have something that's going to make sure that you'll have enough energy to use up. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. From your internship, were there any finds that you had that really stood out that excited you? Uh, yes, I found some giant oysters. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I remember doing a video on Exogyra. And Exogyra was like this really, really big oyster fossil. And they're almost as large as your head. I mean, these are really large oysters. <laughs> wow. So I remember collecting these giant oyster fossils from some of the Cretaceous outcrops. 
Um, one of the coolest finds that I was actually able to do was we were going actually into a, I think, a Middle Eocene site, which is over like 23 to 40 million years old. And we were actually on a riverbank. And this riverbank contained beautifully preserved sand dollar fossils. Mm-hmm. And the thing about it is, is that the sand dollars are very, very delicate. And so when you're chipping through the sediment, we're, we're laying on this riverbank and then there's rafts, you know, going by us. There's rafting people going by us and waving at us as we're chipping out these echinoids. And as we're chipping them out, sometimes you break them because it's just mm-hmm. so delicate. So I remember yelling explicitives because I couldn't get these echinoids fully <laughs> intact. <laughs> Thankfully, I got at least five of them intact when I collect when I was starting to collect them. Mm-hmm. But they're just so delicate. But that was a really a really important and really fun time that I had just going out. And, you know, it's really hot outside, too. So we're by the water so we can kind of cool ourselves down. And uh, we're just chipping out echinoids on the side of a riverbank that used to be part of a shallow sea over, you know, 30 million years ago. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice. That's a good thing about being near water. You could cool off a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I know in, in some of your talks and online, uh, I know it says you've been diagnosed with the autism spectrum disorder. How has that shaped, I guess, you as, as a paleontologist and geologist? That's a good question. So yeah, I when I was around eight years old, I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Um, it used to be called Asperger's, but now it's known as ASD. And yeah, I mean, things have changed dramatically. I remember I didn't really know how to communicate with others, and I'm still learning how to communicate with others. It's still a very learning process. I have issues with auditory, um, with auditory sounds. And so, you know, those particular types of things, I am very... I have difficulty with. But the good thing about my understanding of autism and how I view the world is that because of my interest in paleontology, that has actually been able to help me communicate with other people. And so having that opportunity where I'm passionate about things where many other people aren't, I think is a great opportunity and a great segue to have other conversations with other people about some things that they may not be knowledgeable about. And it gives me an, a a it gives me an opportunity where I can show that passion with other people. And I think being on the autism spectrum has kind of helped me being, hey, hey, we have different brains. We have to learn differently. Not everyone's pathway into this field is going to be, you know, all the way straight through college, you know, A's and B's down the row. You know, I've had to struggle through many different ways to try to find myself into this field and basically be accepted in this field, knowing that I'm autistic. And so knowing other autistic paleontologists and other scientists has kind of helped me feel comfortable with myself. Yeah. Well, you clearly already know your stuff and saying that you haven't even, you know, started your geology degree yet, and yet you're rattling off ages of rocks and Mm -hmm. (laughs) talking about how easy it is. Got all these projects in the works. Yeah, yeah. So (laughs) clearly it's not slowing you down at all. (laughs) One one thing about autism is that, you know, we have, so we basically have a fixation on a couple of other topics. So it may, other fixations, fixations may be, you know, a, a person may be interested in trains or another, another person may be interested in the aircraft. My interest was in dinosaurs, which led me to have another fascination with just geology and paleontology and rocks. Um, I remember, even to this day, I remember my parents were talking about me as a young child, and I would have rocks in my pocket all the time. And here I am, I'm 23 years old, and I'm pulling a rock out of my pocket. So um, I would carry rocks (laughs) in my pockets all the time, and I still do that because it helps me cope with things that are difficult for me, Mm -hmm. like communication. And also with my job, you know, I'm talking with other, I'm in customer service. And so things like that are mm-hmm. very hard for me to, to be able to do. And so I have to have some rocks and fossils by my side to make sure that I, you know, that I'm comfortable with. Because if I'm not, things may be difficult for me. I may have emotional breakdowns and things like that do happen. But having the rocks by your side and knowing that you're comfortable with the situation really help, has helped me being able to grow as a young scientist. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a good hack. Keeping the, the thing around that makes you happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have to. Does that mean you're most comfortable out in the field? Yeah, I am. I am most comfortable. I mean, it's everything is right there. And, you know, you're finding new things that no one has seen before. And so I love that aspect that, that when you're looking at a fossil, many people who are on the spectrum may have different perspectives of things. 
And so we may actually look at something that a scientist may miss out in the field or may miss out in the lab. And so we have that a really good attention to detail that some other people may not have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that whole the whole aspect of science where diversity is super important because if you have everyone looking at the problem the same way, they're all going to come with a similar solution and that solution might not be right. You need the constant challenging for science to go forward. So in addition to all the other types of diversity, neural diversity is also very important. So it's, yes. it's good to hear that you've experienced that firsthand. Yeah, absolutely. Neurodiversity is important. And, you know, there's other people and in, in organizations out there that are actually catching on to that. So when I am doing outfield work, I have to have a set of tools that will help me cope with my environment. So again, I am very um, sensitive to sounds and things of that nature. So I have to have earbuds in my ears to be able to drown out those particular sounds, or I have to have maybe a rock in my pocket to be able to cope with that particular environment that I may not feel comfortable with. So it's basically having all of those tools to be able to cope with your environment. And that's what I've been able to do. Mm -hmm. hmm. It sounds like that would be, would that be your advice to anybody else who might want to get into paleontology and is struggling with things like that to keep rocks handy and then uh, find what's comfortable for them, right? Yeah. 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 Definitely find what's comfortable for you. And, you know, maybe ask one of your siblings, maybe ask one of your parents or maybe ask a close friend, anything, you know, find those resources out there that will eventually will help you to just cope with your environment. And, you know, I'm still learning. I don't have it all together. Trust me, guys. I don't. <laughs> but, you know, I'm still learning. And this is, you know, this is still very new to me. You know, I'm still, you know, growing and shaping my myself, but definitely have those tools that are handy to cope with your environment. I think it's really important to have. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that it just reminds me of everybody when you haven't met somebody and you see them on like social media, you assume that they have like everything figured out and their life is perfect and everything, but there's nobody, <laughs> everybody's oh. working on something. <laughs> everybody. Nobody. Yes. Yeah. Behind that curtain, you don't see all the edits. You don't see, you know, the, the freak out that happened right before the recording, mm -hmm. whatever. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> So I know you've also been recently recognized for your contributions to paleontology, which congratulations. Was it the Paleontological Research Institution's Catherine Palmer Award in 2020? Yes, yes, it was. They mentioned your fossil cataloging system and fossil curation. Can you tell us about how that works? Yeah, so, so when I curate fossils and when I find a fossil, I have to make sure that it's, you know, that it's cataloged. Like, oh my gosh, that's like a really big pet peeve of mine. If something's not cataloged, I mm -hmm. get I, I get crazy. I have to have things <laughs> that are cataloged. Not all the fossils that I have in the collection are cataloged. Some of them are like around the desks and things like that. But anything that I collect or anything that I get from a, a another collection, I have to have it in, I have to have the name, the species, I haven't been doing catalog numbers just yet, but I'm working on that. I have to have basically everything there, not everything there is about the fossil, but basically just basic information on the particular specimen. Because if you have a specimen and you don't have the information with it, you know, that's, that's not going to be helpful if it's going to a museum collection or going to a scientist. So you want to make sure that you have every single thing or, you know, ma mainly what you have that's important for the specimen of when it's in the collection. I've gotten so detailed where I have a whole book that has a list of all the specimens that are in that particular collection that I'm going to work on getting it into a database system. Mm -hmm. And so that's how detailed it could it can be for a lot of people who are in this field. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, you, you kind of mentioned you've got different projects going on at field work, but I, I guess what's, yeah, what's next for you in the next... I don't know, year or so. Well, right now I'm actually working on scientific paper. I'm actually working on my first scientific paper and that is on lower carboniferous sharks from Tennessee. And nice. I'm working I'm working on that and hopefully that'll get published maybe later on next year or maybe later this year um, because the peer, peer review process is crazy. And so being mm -hmm. this is my first scientific paper, you know, it's going to take a while. So yeah. hopefully we'll get it out and we'll get it published by hopefully by this year. And I'm also working on another paper with a another shark tooth, but this is found in Georgia. And this is found in some of the lower Carboniferous rocks that are found in Northwest Georgia. And mm -hmm. so this is a really important fossil um, that was actually found by a good friend of mine, Dr. Brad DeLine, 
um, work on getting that published with another paleontologist, Dr. John Paul Hotnet, over in Maryland. Awesome. Cool. Why wow, you are busy. Yes. <laughs> I am a busy bee. Oh. <laughs> it's good to stay busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it keeps me out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so for our listeners then, where is the best place if they wanted to find out more about you and your work online? Um, you can definitely go to my Twitter. My Twitter page is good. I, I talk about a lot of things about local geology and paleontology and things of that nature. My YouTube channel, uh, Paleo 101, I talk about fossils, geology, and things like that. My Facebook page as well. And um, that that would be a really good resource to you know try to figure out who I am and what I do. <laughs> and for our listeners too, your Twitter is Paleo Cameron, right? Yes, it is. Great. Awesome. And we'll have all those links in our show notes as well. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was an awesome conversation. We didn't know much about Georgia paleontology before, but now we do. No, and geology. Yeah. It's okay. Many people from Georgia don't know about Georgia paleontology <laughs> and geology. So at least you guys are open and learning, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Good. And you're a great resource too, especially with the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much for the great interview, Cameron. After talking about all this cool stuff in Georgia, it makes us really want to come back and see some of these fossils for ourselves. Definitely. And the museums again. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Ida Miris, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Ida Miris was a dromaeosaur theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Uzbekistan in the Bisekti Formation. It's depicted as having a long tail, a snout with teeth, sharp claws, and feathers on the body. However, only a small, damaged fossil brain case has been found. Oh man, that is not very much. No. Basically just the top back of the head. Yes. The fossil was found in 1958 near the village of Idamir. The type species is Idamiris medullaris. It was described in 1976 by Sergei Kurzanov. And the genus name refers to Idamir. The species name refers to the medulla oblongata, the brain part encased in the partial brain case. Oh, so it's actually a little bit lower down, might not be the very top of the skull. Yeah. In 2014, there was a study by Hans Dieter Seuss and Alexander Averyanov that tentatively referred cranial bones, teeth, and vertebrae found in the same formation to Idamiris. So it could be that there are more fossils to this dinosaur. That would be helpful because there is very little you can say about a dinosaur where all you have is a partial brain case. Yes. And that's why today's is so short. And our fun fact of the day is much longer than your dinosaur of the day. (laughs) (laughs) That's rare. (laughs) I don't think it's that rare, actually. The fact is that contrary to popular belief, fossils don't require millions of years to form. Really? Yeah. So I think most people, including myself until recently, thought that all fossils take millions of years to form, probably because the most famous fossils, at least the fossils we talk about all the time, are from dinosaurs, and dinosaurs are millions of years old, and therefore we just kind of assume, oh, well, they must take a long time to form. But really, their bones sat in the ground for much longer as fossils than they did as original bones. When it comes to bones... I was actually trying to figure out how long a bone can last just like out in the world. Mm -hmm. When they're buried, if there's acidic soil, they're usually gone in like 20 years. They really don't last very long. Oh, yeah. That's not long at all, especially in geological time. Yeah, it's like nothing. It just might as well just be gone immediately. When it comes to bones that don't get dissolved by acid, so they can't be in acidic soil, basically, if they're going to become fossils because they will be gone. But if they're in basic soil, or they have the right mineral content, things like that, then they might not dissolve right away. And bones can last for hundreds of years buried just in general, even without fossilizing. And there are cases of like mummies, for example, that are thousands of years old. The oldest one I could find, I think was eight or 9,000 years old that isn't considered a fossil, just like a skeleton basically found somewhere. Possibly because of that, fossils are often defined as remains older than 10,000 years which really isn't that old. No. When you're talking about geological time, that's like hardly anything at all. As much younger than I thought. Yeah. So 
if you're talking about from today to 10,000 years ago, that's also roughly the end of the Paleozoic. That's another possibility for why that 10,000 years is thrown around so often. By definition, that means that most mammoths and all mastodons are considered fossils. It also means that any hominid remains older than 8,000 BCE are considered fossils. For example, all Neanderthal remains are fossils because most of them are about 130,000 to 40,000 years old. Is this why there's confusion between archaeologists and paleontologists? <laughs> they do both deal with fossils, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is true. But I would say age ranges are a really weird and non-scientific way to classify things as fossils. Because like I was saying, depending on the conditions, a bone could be completely gone in 20 years or it could stay as a bone for hundreds of years or even thousands of years without fossilizing. So I think a great example of this is the yucca woolly mammoth, that yucca is the nickname. It died 39,000 years ago in Siberia and has been frozen ever since. There's actually ice on earth that's estimated to be over a million years old. <laughs> so there could be much older frozen things out there. Mm -hmm. Yucca is often called a mummy, but I think even calling it a mummy kind of gives the wrong impression about how well preserved it is. It makes it sound like it's completely lost all of its moisture and it's very modified from its original form. In reality, yucca has almost all of its skin in place and a lot of reddish hair hmm. on it. That's not too surprising. We, we even see dinosaurs that have like very thin skin remains and sometimes feathers. But yucca also has an intact brain, which is considered in excellent condition. It's not like it's brand new, you know, out of a fresh <laughs> mammoth that just died. But you can very clearly see all the different parts of the brain and the texture of it and stuff like that is, is very much a brain. Wow. And you can compare it really directly to an elephant brain, which is super cool. But most impressively, yucca has blood in its veins that's still frozen or maybe partially frozen that scientists managed to extract. Weird. And I don't think like calling something fossilized, which still has blood in its veins. Doesn't seem right. It does not seem right. So the question really is how long fossils take to form. And there are a lot of types of fossils. In fact, some people would call yucca a frozen fossil. <laughs> That's sort of a way to get around it. Or, you know, mummified fossils. There are all sorts of different terms that are used for different old stuff, which you can still identify as an animal or a plant or a bacteria or whatever. But I'm going to focus on permineralization, which is a really hard word to say. Mineralization with per in front of it. This is the main type of fossilization that we see with dinosaur bones. The method of permineralization is basically it needs to get buried quickly to stop scavenging and decay. It needs to stay buried for years. And then there has to be water around it, which isn't acidic, but does carry minerals into the bones or occasionally into other tissue, like in the case where skin is preserved, mm -hmm. then those minerals need to form crystals in a way that fills the open space in the bone to maintain the structure and basically any other organic material which is being eroded. This is why dinosaur bones still preserve their original structure and a lot of their original chemistry, because what's happening is it's minerals just filling in all that space which isn't already a stable calcium compound. And then over time, those things can change more, but that's not necessarily part of the permineralization process. Originally, it was thought that permineralization always took a very long time, but it's now clear that permineralization often has to start very quickly, relatively speaking, or else it will decay and there won't be anything left to fossilize. Hmm. So if you think about those bones that are in the ground, and they're going to be gone in a couple hundred years or maybe at best a thousand years. If they don't start fossilizing in that time, they're just going to decay and be gone. Which might have happened to some dinosaur bones. Oh, certainly. Yeah, basically all of them. Like statistically speaking, the conditions of getting buried almost immediately, not getting scavenged, getting buried deep enough that something doesn't dig you back up or insects don't burrow down to you, bacteria don't get down to you, it has to be relatively anoxic usually, and then you need the right kind of rainwater and mineral content. Sometimes even the right bacteria can help fossilization too. You really need all the stars to align in order for a fossil to become a fossil. There have been some recent experiments though 
that have recreated permineralization and have shown that it can happen in weeks to months. So you could, in theory, see something fossilize. Yes, potentially. I think these are very small things. So I think large specimens still would take years at minimum to permineralize, but we are getting a little bit closer to being able to recreate the fossilization process and really understand exactly the conditions that are required for certain types of fossils. Because there's also a lot of different chemicals that can create fossilization, and it depends on what the thing is made out of, because it's all chemistry. So it has to react differently if it's a plant or if it's an animal. And depending on what's already been eroded away before the fossilization starts, it's incredibly complicated. However, the bottom line is that those specimens that have been studied and could fossilize in weeks to months were in really ideal conditions, but it could take much longer. So I think hundreds to thousands, maybe even 10,000-ish years isn't unreasonable for the process of permineralization. There also isn't really an upper limit when you're talking about fossilization because rocks and fossils are constantly changing with changes in pressure, temperature, and chemistry surrounding the rock. So for example, something could be frozen for tens of thousands of years, like one of these mammoths, and then it could thaw and then be permineralized. That's probably sort of what happened with some of these dinosaur mummies. They may have mummified first and then permineralized. Hmm. So when did it become a fossil in that process? Are we talking about a fossil mummy? Are we talking about a permineralized fossil? You know, it was sort of a fossil the whole time, <laughs> basically. It could also be that something permineralized quickly could be altered after the fossil gets buried under kilometers of crust because that extra pressure and other chemistry around it can change the actual composition of the molecules inside the fossils so they can become new molecules, new chemistry inside those bones with the temperature and pressure you can get when there's all that, you know, kilometers of rock on top of you. Another really crazy example, but one that we've actually seen, is that a fossil or a bone could slowly erode while leaving a cast for silica-rich water to fill, and then over about five million years, it could turn into opal. Like what we see in Lightning Ridge? Exactly. Then what we didn't see in Lightning Ridge, but could also happen, is that over even more time, the opal could slowly transform into quartz, which is a more thermodynamically stable form of silicon dioxide. So basically, fossils in their present form may have taken millions of years to form, but the millions of years aren't necessary. They were in some earlier fossilized form long ago, but they are still likely changing. Another fun way to put that is that by the end of the Cretaceous period, almost all of the non-avian dinosaurs that would ever fossilize had already fossilized. That's so weird to think about. <laughs> yeah. So T-Rex might have tripped over an ancient fossilized stegosaur plate. We often talk about how ancient stegosaur was compared to T-Rex. But it could have also tripped over a much more recent Albertosaurus femur or even another Tyrannosaurus femur, <laughs> or, you know, because Tyrannosaurus was around for well over 10,000 years. So there's a good chance that some of them had already fossilized while T-Rex was still roaming around. And on that mind-blowing note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already joined our community of dinosaur enthusiasts, you can do so at patreon.com slash I Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.